Well, I think Christmas was complicated for me. I mean, there's a, it's it's actually, there, there's a personal element to it. There's a very vicious streak of familial depression that runs in my family. And so um, my father was quite prone to that. And so Christmas could be a dark time for us, although it, it was also all of the positive things it was supposed to be at the same time. So, and then I guess the other thing is, so that's the personal end of it. The more metaphysical end is of course that I've spent a lot of time over the last three decades trying to understand Christianity and what the, the rituals and routines and stories mean. And so that's added another dimension to it. I mean, I understand, for example, the mythological idea that at the darkest point of the year, that's when the hero emerges. That's a very old mythological idea. Of course, you don't need a hero unless the darkness is intense, right? So it, it makes sense that that's what would call forth a hero. And of course, that's a lot of what's celebrated symbolically at Christmas. The idea of the lights on the trees is the return of illumination, right? Because the sun is starting to come back. All these things are layered on top of one another. And so it's, it's, it's a remarkable, it's one of the things that's really made me so struck as a consequence of studying Christianity is that so many levels of meaning stack on top of one another in an isomorphic manner it's and support one another you know there's a cosmic story that's associated with Christmas which is the death and rebirth of the Sun and then there's I mean the, the actual solar orb and then there's the you know more prosaic story of the birth of a baby which is of course a miraculous event in everyone's life well I mean what we hope is that the time around Christmas gives us a glimpse into what human relations could be like if we organize them very carefully. And I think that that can happen. But the problem is, is that you don't get peace and goodwill towards man merely by having the time of year. It's something that you really have to work at. And I mean, a lot of the problems that I've indicated that were characteristic of my family and my extended family, we've actually addressed to quite with quite a bit of success over the last three decades as a consequence of, well, partly because I became a clinical psychologist and started to understand these things and because the biochemistry has been more well understood and, and but it is hard on people around Christmas because as you said, the hope and the reality, it's it's a point of the year where hope and reality can war most most viciously and it can be very, very hard on people. You're right about it serving as a magnifier. That's it brings out the best and the worst. And and I suppose that's useful too, because you need to have the worst brought up so that brought out so that you can hypothetically de deal with it. But it's no it's no joke. I mean, even in the Christmas story itself, you know, I mean, so Christ is the eternal infant the eternal hope let's say and the eternal hope of mankind just like a, an infant is the eternal hope of mankind but you know he's born in lowly circumstances and in extreme peril right because all the firstborns are under um under death sentence essentially and there's an archetypal element to that too which is really important to understand which is that even if the hero is divine then he's always born in in the extreme danger that characterizes existence itself and so in some sense, that balance between tragedy and catastrophe and tyranny and hope that typifies Christi Christmas in reality for for day to day people is also built right into the story. I mean, they're in a manger for God's sake, right? It's a stable. And so it's pretty unstable, so to speak. And then, of course, there's all these radical political events going on. And well, that's that's the way of mankind, radical political and social events going on. That's the way of mankind. I mean, the, the, the tree is a very interesting symbol because, of course, the tree is is the tree in the Garden of Eden, the, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil and the tree of life. And the tree for Christmas is mostly the tree of life. And the tree is also the structure that unites heaven with earth. And the lights on the tree symbolize um, or represent even illumination and the reemergence of, of light in the darkness. And a lot of that was was extracted in some sense from the pagan symbolism that was that existed there prior to Christianity. I mean, the tree idea, for example, you know, that plays a, the idea that there's a tree that unites heaven and hell, which is so, sort of something akin to Jacob's ladder, is a central tenet of shamanism. And there are all sorts of strange shamanic echoes that permeate Christianity. And the Christmas story, like Santa Claus is a good example. There's very interesting documentation about the relationship between the red and white of Santa Claus, for example, and the use of Amanita muscaria mushrooms among the shamanic, uh, in the shamanic tradition throughout Siberia and across the north, uh, across the entire northern 
strata of Europe. So yeah, it, it's a very, very deep and strange mixture of desert and and frigid cold and 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 celebration and I guess that's also partly what's given it such longevity as a as a celebration. Let's manifest some hope and say, well, it is a dark time and we're badly polarized and this is the perfect time for the rebirth of the hero. And that's what that's what Christmas is about. And it's about that at every level. So you can allow that to be reborn in your own heart. That that you know, and the birth of Christ is the birth of the logos, right? The word that sets that that extracts order out of chaos. It's the thing that always, always, eternally sets things right. That's what we're celebrating at Christmas. And you want to welcome that into your heart and into your family. Because if you don't, you're lost. This this stuff is so these these ideas are so necessary and so vital that you cannot live without them. And so it's useful to to understand profoundly what Christmas means. It means that the Logos is eternally reborn at the darkest period of time. And if you're not on your knees in gratitude for that, then you know very little about the horrors of the world. If you think about the Christian world, the ultimate mentor is Christ. And you could say that being a Christian, or you could say that being a psychologist, and if you said it being a psychologist, you would say, well, it's by definition that the ultimate mentor is Christ. And what Christianity has been, as it unfolds itself over the last 2,000 years, is an attempt to engage all of the people within that belief system in a dialogue about what that ideal actually constitutes. You know, and there's tradition that feeds into that, the biblical stories and, and the corpus of tradition that goes along with that, but all of it is a collective attempt to specify that ideal so that people can use it as a target to further their development. And that's not delusional. That, that furthering of development is unbelievably useful practically. Whatever God is, the, the best element of him can plausibly be brought forth as a consequence of the manifestation of what's best in us. And that might be the willingness to sacrifice and the willingness to trust and the and the, the the courage to love your neighbor, the courage to love your enemy. And, and, and this is a profound question. It's like, would reality shine a more benevolent face upon us if we were all as good as we could be? And that's the Christian idea. And I, I can't see that that idea is wrong. If you acted as if God was love, if you believe that, and that would be manifest in your perceptions and your actions, that that would invite the deity of love into existence.